Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, SETA DC. Today we have a panel on Russian foreign policy. It is mostly uh, on a book on uh, the new geopolitical realities for Russia, edited by uh, Nurshin Güney and Vishna Korkmaz. And uh, we will go over the uh, increasing Russian assertiveness in foreign policy and uh, the implications of this new Russian foreign policy to uh, the foreign policy of United States, foreign policy of European Union, and of course its implications for Turkish-Russian relations as well. Uh, we have three excellent panelists and uh, Nurshin Güney. Uh, she is a professor at Bahçeşehir University in Cyprus campus and she's a member of Turkey's Presidential Security and Foreign Policy Council. And Ellen Vasilina, uh, she's the CEO of the Transatlantic Global Advisory. And Vishne Korkmaz, uh, she is a professor at Yildiz Technical University. So uh, without uh, uh, further introduction, I think I will uh, pass the floor for uh, Nurshin Güney. And Nurshin, just give us a little bit about your book and okay. uh, especially the uh, the uh, division that you did in your uh, Russian foreign policy from 2008 until 2008, in starting off the Russian assertiveness with the Russian invasion of Georgia, and then Russian in 2014, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Tell us what did change in Russian foreign policy in the last two decades, and why those changes took place. Okay, thank you so much. Um, first of all, uh, many thanks for inviting us and uh, having the ch for us uh, to uh, talk about uh, the book that I edited. And I also, with this occasion, would like to thank to my colleagues and friends again oh, that they gave a hand and we together uh, made this book. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Yeah, <laughs> okay. And so, about your questions, as you see, the title is The New Geopolitical Realm for Russia and from Black Sea to the Mediterranean uh, the title is itself is uh, quite explanatory what has happened in the last uh, two decades or so but mostly in the last uh, decade I guess and uh, the, by the time uh, we decided to uh, write this uh, and edit uh, I, uh, myself uh, this book. Uh, we were just uh, watching the events that were unfolding one after another. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, what is interesting, yes, uh, since 90s, we have seen that Russia was, after completing this uh, period of uncertainty, uh, it has started to gain uh, uh, some power and uh, it has become uh, polishing its muscles. And then uh, due to the rise of uh, oil prices and everything, uh, uh, we have seen that uh, a new Russia was coming up. Uh, this one is said to be an assertive one. And also uh, we, have this, we have begun to see a rising, resurging Russia just nearby, uh, around our neighborhood, both in Black Sea as being Turkey, as well as uh, very soon we were about to see a new neighbor in Mediterranean as well. And at that time, uh, we have seen that uh, in IR studies, people were trying to understand what this new Russia and what is its security and foreign policy is. And that is how, in theoretical uh, explanations, people try to revisit uh, the memories of geopolitics, this classical meaning of <laughs> geopolitics. And then they were trying to match up words like Macandrism, Heartland, Eurasianism, at one hand, as well as they were trying to uh, mention uh, simultaneously the, uh, by evaluating Russian behavior uh, as assertiveness, resurgency, things like that. So this was the coincidence that was happening. And that is how, of course, IR academicians were trying to diagnose what is happening in the Russian uh, foreign and security policy. According to some, it was a mechanist uh, movement that's happening by looking at, uh, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, right after the colored revolution, uh, this 2008 Georgian intervention, which was followed in uh, 2004, 14 in Ukrainian intervention. 
and so on. Uh, they were thinking that Russian uh, Cold War mercantilism was back, but they were wrong. Mm. Um, uh, uh, in the contrary to this viewpoint, there is also uh, Mahanist uh, view uh, uh, supporters, and they thought by looking at Russia, uh, you know, polishing, trying to polish its Black Sea fleet and modernization, its navy, and the doctrines that they had issued in 2001, 2010, 2015, uh, where there was a very assertive naval uh, dialogue there, where they wanted to reach uh, through Black Sea to Mediterranean and even beyond to the uh, ocean, oceans and overseas. And they mentioned and underlined in those doctrines that they wanted to blue water capacity, mm -hmm. which in the end they couldn't achieve this. But they said since it was written uh, in these documents, they said, OK, now we're seeing a mechanist uh, Russia uh, conducting its foreign and security Policy, and that is why they are in Syria after 2015. But uh, they have missed something. Uh, this is what we have uh, figured out. Actually, I was arguing with my colleague Vishnu. I said, uh, these, are, these people are wrong. I'm not a theoretician, but just a uh, humble IR academician professor, uh, as you mentioned, uh, is, uh, located in uh, Cyprus. I said to Vishnu, this is a hybrid mechanism that Russia is going through. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this was the definition of mine. And I had proofs at hand, of course. Uh, and we discussed with her, and this is how this book, up, book uh, came about. And we uh, decided that uh, the behavior of Russia, especially in the field of foreign and security policy, needs a new theoretical context yeah. and a geopolitical new redefinition is a must there. And that is how in the first chapter with my colleague Vishnu Korkmaz, we said that Russia is hedging between mechanism and mechanism. And this was a must, not a choice of hers, but this was a necessity that she was doing. And also, they tried uh, after, uh, as uh, you're going to be, if you have the chance of reading my colleague's uh, uh, Alan's chapter, you would see that uh, Russia has tried to become a mercantilist uh, uh, power and try to, af after the experience of Ukraine, uh, it has so shown that it has limits as being a land power in Europe meaning uh, conquering and controlling the area mass in Europe, either or uh, uh, integrating into Europe. She has failed to do that. And she thought she needed to go to, down to Mediterranean and uh, uh, apply mechanics policy there. But there, too, even though she had limited capacity of A2, AD uh, military might, uh, she had achieved a lot, actually. We shouldn't, uh, uh, you know, de what they have achieved. Achieve, but they have seen their limits, and so um, they decided that honest policy is, in fact, a difficult and challenging job. It is an expensive one. You need to have a good economy. You need to have a, a blue water capacity, for instance, uh, in terms of uh, naval uh, uh, capacity. You need to have uh, ships and aircrafts and things like that. You need to have a, a you know stable economy, as I said, and other things as well. And you need to go beyond the challenge of Montreux Convention, 1936, to go through from Black Sea to Mediterranean to bring your uh, navy very easily down to uh, Mediterranean and things like that. And they figure out that uh, they have to act uh, in a hybrid way, meaning using every possible tools at their hands, including, uh, for instance, trade, energy, and uh, ring of France. That is why I'm meaning hedging. And other than just ships, ports and uh, other arms. military means arms. So this is what uh, I have uh, come into a conclusion after arguing with my friend. <laughs> and we said uh, Russia is in position so as to fool these loopholes in Mahanis policy that it had launched uh, right after uh, Ukrainian crisis. So, so they have come to a point of having double failure, both in mechanism and this time also in mechanism, in their strategies, in their sea power strategy this time. So as to not to fail more, 
they decided to uh, bring up uh, and uh, somehow substitute the loopholes in their mechanist strategy by, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, relying on A2, A2 capacities that at, at, at their hand and, if possible, to make it more uh, strengthened, but also at the same time brings more substitutes, uh, like uh, bringing up new friends, uh, like, uh, as I said, in the energy field, which they have advantages and, at the one hand, disadvantages too. So, uh, Turkey and uh, Iran has come into a fore in this picture in uh, Russia to uh, make a progress in their hybrid mechanism, which is a limited mechanism that they are still uh, pursuing in the Mediterranean region. And uh, also, they, as I said, uh, they try to uh, benefit uh, in every niches that West is making uh, uh, mistakes uh, in the region as well. So that is how in 2015 onwards, what is Russia is doing is this. And they re-evaluated their uh, uh, doctrines, naval doctrines as well. And they knew that they would not have uh, this mechanist dream operational anymore. That is why in the uh, proclamation of uh, Russian defense uh, ministries uh, 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 you would see that they were decided to bring up, modernize their uh, navy, but uh, instead of big uh, aircrafts, they uh, go for uh, literization of vessels and frigates and things like that. So they knew their limits, but they make the most of it at the time being. But what I would say, uh, the future is uncertain. Uh, this is another uh, problem for them, ahead of them. So far, they did a good success. As I said, they are in uh, Syria. They have two bases there. They made bubbles. And these bubbles that starts from Baltics down to the uh, Mediterranean is a great success. Uh, but uh, they, they know that they're overstretched and they have uh, limitations, and that is why they are hedging between macroandrism and mechanism, and instead they decided to go along with uh, uh, this uh, limited mechanism, which I call hybrid one. And in this puzzle, of course, uh, what will be very important for them, how they would manage to uh, 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 go along with the uh, new ring of friends they have uh, achieved so far, especially in this region. Region. And I guess uh, probably Vishne will explain more, so I won't go uh, further from this uh, point. Uh, Turkey gains a close, uh, great importance in the conduct of this new hybrid mechanism in this region. Uh, so uh, this is, was the real idea behind of this uh, book. So uh, everyone of us tried to uh, focus on uh, this new sea power of uh, Russian uh, conduct of foreign and security policy from Black Sea to Mediterranean, and each of us has tried to uh, see and evaluate from its own perspective and the topic they, they focus on it. And they, uh, decide, they in the end, in the conclusion, uh, come to a point where they can find if there is limitation or validity of uh, this uh, new uh, Russian uh, foreign uh, policy that was conducted in uh, Black Sea and uh, also in the Mediterranean. And we had uh, six chapters. Uh, and uh, the first chapter was the theoretical diagnosis that we have made. Uh, Alan has worked on the Ukrainian uh, case. And then we have also energy chapters that devoted uh, two chapters for that. Uh, and the uh, uh, last chapter was about, again, this uh, uh, mutual mm -hmm. interdependency where Turkey has gained a lot of uh, uh, linkages that it has made uh, towards to Russia that uh, Vishna will talk about. And uh, this is all about it. I guess uh, I you. can stop here, and perhaps you might have questions that I may uh, like to answer. Thank I you very much. I will have questions as well. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay uh, then. Uh, Ms. Uh, Vasilina, about the uh, Ukrainian crisis, mm -hmm. what really happened? And we know what happened in Ukrainian crisis, but how Ukrainian crisis changed Russian foreign policy? Did it influence in any different ways? Sure. Can, can we talk about a rupture in Russian foreign policy in the aftermath of the Ukrainian crisis? Sure, thank you. And thank you, Nersen. Thank you 
Sita for inviting me. I'm so pleased to be with my colleagues once again. Hey, okay, thank you. <laughs> it's lovely to be with you today. Uh, my chapter is basically about how, um, as you rightly point out, Nursen and Vishne, uh, this in-between Ukraine that is straddled on a European sea, which is the Black Sea. Um, from the 90s, as you know, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, uh, Ukraine found itself in a difficult position, and Russia also found itself in a difficult position. Uh, what to do as Bulgaria, Romania joined NATO, uh -huh. um, and then uh, Georgia, which was leaning uh, closer. Uh, so, and then to see Ukraine and Ukraine wanting to join NATO, join the EU, and also on the other side, and I go through two explanations from the external side and from the internal side of what was going on. On the outside, you had also a, um, a UE, uh, sorry, a European Union uh, integration fatigue mm -hmm. uh, after those 10 countries were integrated in 2004, which were all on the eastern uh, border of Europe. Um, and, and the difficulties that I won't have time to go into today of integrating those countries into the European Union, which gave some thought to Europe and to Russia on the other side of where UK, Ukraine's place was in Europe. Um, we talk about, of course, the recompositions and how Russia also created its parallel market system to help Ukraine integrate into some sort of system with other countries in the former Soviet Union. Um, and the importance also of how the uh, transatlantic community, the US and the Europeans, pushed uh, the borders of Europe all the way up to the Russian uh, frontier, the former Russian frontier. Um, the uh, desire for um, membership, but the difficulty for some of these Eastern European countries to step up and to become membership, and the lack of incitement, meaning there were the acquis communautaire, which means that they had rules and regulations to come into Europe, which some of the Eastern European countries found more difficult to adhere to or to simply uh, achieve. And this was an opportunity also for Russia uh, in dealing with its little brother, Ukraine, uh, to keep uh, a, a close relationship with Ukraine. Notably, Ukraine, as you know, is, produces the much minerals that in the former Soviet Union, has the port that we know uh, now in, in Crimea, uh, Odessa, and the access to projection in the Black Sea and out into the Mediterranean. So um, these issues were not easy for Ukraine and Russia to get their heads around together. Uh, to be in step, and also from the European side, there was somewhat, you know, I wrote in a piece one time, I said, who's going to fight for Ukraine before all these hostilities broke out? Uh, Ukraine is in a unique geographic position, has unique uh, capacities, economic uh, defense, uh, and uh, should be considered to be one of the uh, most important uh, countries on the Black Sea. If you just look at, for example, I have a few figures here. If I could just take a minute to go through the size of the economies. For example, Turkey is 851 billion. Ukraine is 112 billion. Russia is 1.5 trillion. Germany, 3.6 trillion. Now, if you look at the size of those economies and the size of the Russian economy, and Nushin pointed out very justly, Russia must be able to keep up with its, um, its, its doctrines, its defense policies. As you know, Russia has been on the defensive ever since the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and against Europe, even though there was a time when NATO mm -hmm. wanted to integrate, Russia had a Russia committee, had a Ukraine committee. This was all back in the 90s. So, we really haven't gone too much forward. And Nershin points out a very important point, that they could no longer go over land uh, mm -hmm. and expand and get the Lebensraum that they need because there's frozen conflict still in Moldova. There's frozen conflict still in Georgia. There's now the Donbass in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So where are they going to go next? You have to ask yourself. And rightly so. So the expansion or the projection uh, 
had to go out to sea. I might want to mention, too, that the revolutions uh, played a very important role in how Ukraine, Georgia, and, and then later on, as I point out, in North Africa, um, proved to be an important um, clinching point, I would say, also for Russia, for Europe, uh, to see where these countries would like to stand up to and be, come and decide for their self-determination. Um, this was also a challenge to Moscow. Uh, Moscow did not want these type of demonstrations either. And how do they handle that economically and the trade between? And as many of you know, uh, many Ukrainians and Russians have family ties. And so it's not easy and a black and white issue to say, OK, we're going to separate. We're going to step away with so many historical years of uh, relationships between. Um, these revolutions, of course, uh, fought some of the main uh, challenges that are still present today, such as corruption, election fraud, uh, banded capitalism. The economy wasn't really working well. Uh, the model uh, wasn't really working well. And I always say that the CIS failed in providing a better model, an economic and political and social model for some of these former Soviet Union countries. Um, then, of course, there's the issue of energy. Uh, there is no other supplier at this time, as you point out and some of our contributors point out, for European energy supplies. There isn't any one that can supply the, the energy that Russia can supply. So Russia still has that capacity to supply Europe with a dependency ratio of, for example, 25% in all over Europe and 100% as close as you come to the border, for example, in the Baltic states. So there's still, as you and I believe Vishne pointed out, some interdependencies mm -hmm. uh, in those countries between Russia, between Europe, between Turkey, which I won't mm -hmm. develop. But um, these interdependencies, these dependencies on energy are really something to consider. Um, Europe cannot go without Russian gas or oil. Yes, they get some from the south, from Libya and Algeria, but the major portion comes from the east now that they're rerouting Nord Stream. Uh, so Russia has managed to make inroads too on the energy uh, for Europe, bringing this Nord Stream 2 onto line. Um, there's a whole movement, as you know, and I was in Bulgaria, and that's where Nershin and I were at a conference, remember? Yeah. Uh, where Twice. we were talking about the European Energy Union. Uh, energy is big on the agenda of how to reduce dependencies for Europe on Russian energy, for example. This all came about following the Ukrainian crisis and how Russia can be a supplier, a stable, a reliable supplier uh, for Europe. Now, of course, there's a big movement, as you've probably seen, around also of reducing CO2. Uh, the COP 21, 15 um, that we've been seeing that is really pushing towards uh, a re reduction of dependency on fossil fuels. Um, but then there's probably other suppliers. Can you think of some other suppliers, such as Azerbaijan or Iran? Or USA. They... Or USA or USA, but geographically speaking, yeah. don't you think? Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more practical with Nabucco, oh, for example. Uh, and <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> of course it's closer. So, um, and then I would say, let's think of who else can replace Russia in its policies and its dominance in the energy area. And finally, what about the sanctions? What about the containment of Russia? Um, Nershin said so well, you know, uh, Russia is trying other policies to expand, to project uh, now in with its blue water policies. Um, excluding Russia has not helped Europe. As many of you may not know, I spent most of my life in France. And I can tell you, Russia was not the only one hurt by the sanctions. France and all the European countries were also hurt by the sanction. Russians destroyed Tons of cheese, French cheese, for example. <laughs> Don't think that it was only Russia that was going to get hurt by the sanctions. All of our French cheese producers you know, were being hurt by that. So I'm just saying these interdependencies, these linkages are, are on many levels um, 
uh, with Russia. And I'll, I will stop there. I have so much more I could tell you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Vishnanam on uh, okay. Turkish-Russian relations, okay. which is one of the hot topics in this town. Uh, yeah. And provides <laughs> us a perspective about the state of this relation. OK, thank you. Uh, when we started, when we together with Nurshin and Eda started to write this chapter, we had two questions in our mind. <laughs> One is related to what Nurshin and also Alani mentioned, the shortcomings of Russia uh, in following her uh, very ambitious Mahani's dreams, we can say dreams actually, <laughs> uh, command and control of Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and we ask how Russia uh, can compensate her shortcomings and how this compensation strategy actually creates, uh, creates impact over Turkish-Russian relations. This is the first question we ask. And the second question is related to nature of Russian-Turkish relations. Uh, as we know, uh, Russian-Turkish relations uh, has been usually described by referring asymmetrical interdependence. And asymmetrical interdependence uh, usually has usually, uh, as a model, criticized by uh, some scholars because uh, the dependent party is assumed to be Turkey. The more dependent party is assumed to be Turkey because of Turkish increasing need, needs of energy uh, coming from Russian imports, um, uh, Russian imported gas. Uh, and uh, we ask if it is so, uh, how Turkey's bargaining power is increasing at the face of Russia, even in the very critical issues, uh, and even in the security issues uh, like Syria, in which uh, both uh, parties have not only similar, but also diverging interests. And why we ask also, uh, associated with this question, why Russia is still willing to uh, get into bargaining with Turkey, uh, why Turkish uh, bargaining power is increasing. Uh, by asking these questions, we uh, actually uh, perceive that we need a new conceptual framework to understand real nature of Russian-Turkish relations. Uh, and that is why uh, we uh, try to find new tools. The first tool is provided by the theory itself, actually, for us. Um, uh, uh, and it is related to um, uh, how we evaluate asymmetrical interdependence or asymmetries in the interdependent relationship. Because usually, uh, the <coughs> scholars who look to the or observing, uh, try to observe uh, Russian-Turkish relations usually ignore the um, uh, absolute gain and how Russia uh, give importance to absolute gain uh, when we compare the non-cooperation situation uh, with Turkey, of course, uh, and uh, linkage strategies. Uh, mutually advantageous linkage strategies, which used uh, very successfully by Ankara at the face of uh, hybrid Mahanist offer of Russia. Uh, in this chapter, so we argued that the space associated with absolute gain in Russian-Turkish relations uh, have been uh, enlarged during the last couple of years because both sides uh, choose to intensify and deepen the interdependent relationship uh, existing between Moscow and Ankara already by initiating other uh, cooperative deals in very, very sensitive issues areas or sensitive sectors like energy uh, cooperation as Turk uh, Street, uh, like S-400 years defense uh, cooperation, like joint patrols in Syria today, et cetera, et cetera. And also uh, like nuclear energy cooperation in Apkuyo uh, nuclear power plant. Uh, in this linkage strategies, Ankara used her upper hand in uh, Montreux Strait regimes uh, and her key position as demand side in both Turk Citream uh, nuclear power plant project and also as 400s to make the bilateral uh, cooperation in security issues more attractive to Russia. Uh, 
And Moscow recognized these linkages as mutually advantageous one uh, because of impact of certain geopolitical factors, which uh, summarized by Nushin very uh, well uh, at the first stage of our intellectual fighting as in, uh, hybrid mechanism. Uh, Russia wanted to and still wants to form a kind of ring of France. Who, but these France are capable France. They have certain uh, A to AD capabilities both in political uh, and diplomatic and military sense. And by uh, this ring of France strategy, this hybrid mechanist strategy, Russia wants to achieve uh, some objectives. It is very wise strategy because by this way, uh, Moscow explores opportunity of using her France influence <laughs> to make certain areas free from their rival's excess. And so uh, by doing uh, this, she can use this friendship strategy as a kind of wedge strategy against her rivals. Former rivals like NATO, uh, NATO uh, actually strengthened its posture in Mediterranean. We know uh, that she returned uh, by looking return of Russia to Mediterranean, she returned to uh, Mediterranean because uh, she left the, this area after the uh, end of the Cold War. Uh, and also informal rivals, by uh, saying informal rivals, I mean a flexible uh, alliances or uh, let's say quasi-alliances or a rapprochement, uh, but these rapprochements or quasi-alliances or alignments has anti-Russian, uh, anti-Iranian, and anti-Turkey perspective or uh, balancing objective. So uh, Russia use uh, this, I mean, uh, um, uh, hybrid mechanist strategy, this uh, ring of friendship strategy as a wedge strategy to prevent the development of this um, access or this uh, influence of this rival um, strategies. And by doing uh, this, by, the, uh, by, doing, um, by preventing the influence of her rivals, Kremlin also uh, using this ring of friendship strategy is refraining from direct confrontation with the USA. Uh, but also we should admit that Kremlin is, um, is lucky uh, and her chance uh, is deriving from the fact that USA underestimated both Russian capabilities and importance of possible impact of hybrid Mahanist strategies on the balance of power in the Mediterranean. And Kremlin's chance is deriving from the fact that USA was too ignorant to perceive that Turkey emerged as a key factor, key element in this hybrid Mahanist strategy of Russia uh, in both Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And uh, Kremlin's chance is deriving the, uh, from the fact that Russians have capable or have enough capacity to offer some important carrots to Turkey, while uh, actually USA follows the strategy of deterrence based on punishment or punishment diplomacy Thank or you. just sticks. So uh, Turkey emerged, uh, all in all, Turkey emerged as the key actor in Russian hybrid mechanist strategy because of numbers of reasons. I just want to uh, uh, refer, uh, mention some of them. Uh, first of all, cooperative regimes for a most east-west, uh, north-south energy transit regime exists between two sides. And this regime, uh, or the uh, cooperation with Turkey uh, under famous Turkic stream, uh, gained importance in the eyes of Russia because Russians need a European store or it should be open to uh, Russian gas. Yes, uh, there are rivals in the market, uh, and uh, USA actually try, uh, tries to sell its gas as politically correct gas. Expensive, shell based LNG, expensive but politically correct. And we know that politically correct projects, politically correct 
commodities uh, can find their uh, consumers uh, because of numbers of reasons. Um, and Ankara uh, needs a partner in her step gap measures uh, related to air defense system. And Russia needs a partner to keep her clean, to be a good, reliable supplier in both uh, energy and critical uh, infrastructure technology, nuclear technology to possible Market. consumers mm-hmm. uh, in the Mediterranean and Middle East uh, area. Uh, Ankara has already started to develop her own A2 AD capabilities, militarily and um, um, politically in its neighboring regions and not only on land, but also on sea. Uh, And in the diplomatic processes like Astana, uh, Sochi, Idlib, then again Sochi, actually Moscow recognized the importance of these capabilities in the field. Um, Also, despite of being a member of NATO, Ankara has seemed to follow a more independent or divergent policy in the region because she needed, she needs still uh, security assurances at the face of coming divergent threats from the South. And USA seemed to be reluctant and too divided to recognize this need because of existing American strategy to support uh, weak actors in the region, in the field. And Ankara has upper hand in controlling two of the two ch- checkpoints of three. Uh, I mean, Turkey Straits and uh, agency. She has uh, naval supremacy there, uh, uh, and the third one is Swiss. So uh, she has an upper hand determining a balance of power in Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, Last but not least, Moscow perceived that the newly initiated anti-Turkey and we can add anti-Iranian axes or alignments in the region has also a potential to constrain Russian influence in the region in the future. So uh, maybe the alliances uh, can be seen or perceived or announced as anti-Turkey or anti-Turkish, has anti-Turkish character, but uh, Moscow um, perceive, uh, uh, perceives them as anti-Russian also. Uh, that's all this broke to uh, the conclusion that Turkey and Russia prefer to use mutual advantages linkage to develop cooperation in various strategic sectors. In this chapter, we evaluated how this cooperation is developed in three sectors, uh, as I mentioned before, Turkey Stream, Aquia Nuclear Power Plant, and S-400 years. Of course, this project and the interdependencies here uh, can bring uh, their own costs and risks uh, for both sides. Uh, but with the initiation of these strategically valuable projects for Russia, Ankara has strengthened its bargaining position in the existing bilateral mutual dependence between two capitals. So at the end of the chapter, we expected actually two things. Turning off this asymmetrical relationship, asymmetrical interdependence, interdependent relationship between Moscow and Tur- uh, uh, Ankara to a more symmetrical one in which the sites have more equal say or voice uh, to create a win-win situation. And we also expect reflection of this change from asymmetrical to more symmetrical uh, interdependence in the more uh, problematic areas of bilateral relations, including Syria. And this brings us to today's uh, Syrian case. Um, uh, yes, there are still many ambiguities in the field, and uh, we don't know how the future brings uh, new changes and challenges for both sides. But after the 
deals, two deals between Moscow and Turk Ankara, between uh, Washington DC and Ankara. Uh, in the northern part of the Syria, uh, Russia and Turkey is, uh, are, uh, um, uh, they, uh, they seem to uh, emerge as winning parties of the northern Syrian game, uh, at least uh, in, in the time being. So um, this is because, this is because uh, Moscow uh, has very successfully followed Hibrit Mahani's strategy in the face of Turkey, and Ankara has very successfully followed uh, mutually advantageous linkage strategy at the face of Moscow, and this is because uh, actually USA underestimated the potential of these strategies in the regional balance of power. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, before opening the floor for questions, I have a short question for uh, Norshin Hanım. Nobody mentioned President Putin in the presentations. <laughs> Where is President Putin? In this? <laughs> he's in the middle of it. Yeah, he's in the middle of it. Tell me, he's Tell me if, he can, mean, if he can dismantle I mean. this strategic outlook from <laughs> President Putin. And where is President Putin here? Well, he is in charge of uh, the conduct of Russian foreign and security policy. I can, mean, it be, can it be the same foreign policy if Boris Yeltsin or any other leader existed? I don't think it will be changed because uh, Russia, uh, I mean, of course, uh, the rhetoric might change, but uh, Russia today, mm -hmm. uh, after the dissolution of Soviet Union, of course, there is a, uh, you know, uh, they, they look for past, this glory past, being the superpower, they, uh, even though they are a great power at the moment. They are, uh, you know, part of the UN Security Council. It is an, an, it's one of the uh, five nuclear uh, weapon states. Mm -hmm. I mean, you name it. Okay, uh, they are under sanctions. Uh, they, their economy is very much dependent on uh, the fluctuations of oil prices and so on. And uh, we can add more, uh, you know, uh, restrictions uh, that uh, Russian foreign and security policy uh, can uh, manage or cannot manage. Uh, but, uh, for instance, sanctions are not hurting uh, uh, Russian foreign and conduct policy, but which is very crucial is what will happen to the oil prices in terms yeah. of its effect on its economy. Yeah. And that is how Russia can, uh, you know, flexible its conduct of foreign policy. Russia of today, uh, starting with uh, uh, Putin days, uh, I would say, uh, it is, not, it is very much aware of its limitations. But the way it talks, you know, as if it used to be a great power or superpower like yesterday, is not a reality on the ground. But they assume and they observe very well uh, the loopholes and the mistakes that is made by the American administration, mm -hmm. not of even today. It started with Obama, uh, as you know. That is how uh, they came back uh, where they left the Middle East in the Cold War years, through the back door of uh, uh, Syria. And so what I'm saying is that uh, they will uh, try to, as, uh, as I believe, and absorbing uh, the uh, you know, realities on the ground related to Russia, uh, they would continue this uh, hybrid mechanism uh, policy, even if, you know, we'll have somebody else uh, in the future, because there is a limitation what they can do. Okay, so uh, if Putin, <laughs> Nurshin just mentioned that Putin, if there was another leader, the strategy would be more or less same. So do you think if there wasn't any association agreement between Ukraine or rumors of that agreement between Ukraine and Russia. Would Russian foreign policy be the same towards Ukraine? So if... How could, the external factors influence Russian foreign policy? So if Russia and, for example, even Ukraine had been accepted into the EU, had mm. been accepted mm. into NATO, things might look different. However, Nurshin points out something But I'm that's asking very just important. Ukraine. So if Ukraine was accepted. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. linked. it's yeah. linked. You can't, it's, it's, you can't separate the yeah. two out, actually. And you can see that both of them are out. And I think uh, the fact that Ukraine and Russia did not want to join NATO, did not want to join the EU, did not want to join the EU Energy Union, yeah. tells you that, yes, they are limited, but, but they are interested in keeping, as both of you had pointed out, their balance of power and their predominance in, in Europe. 
in Europe because they are a Euro Russia is a European power geologically. If you look at the land mass, Eurasia is a geological, it's one piece. It's not separate. People that want to separate Russia out of Europe are mistaken. It won't be separate. So Russia is going to live out its dominance and its balance of power in that geographic, geological arena. Okay. And if there wasn't any uh, sudden toll in relations between Turkey and uh, sudden, actually, crisis between Turkey and Russia after the shutdown of the Russian jet, mm -hmm. would you expect the same kind of sudden rapprochement between Turkey and Russia? Ah. Uh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it is a tricky question because I think this kind I of... I like my question. question. <laughs> <laughs> I made it tricky. So. Uh, because this, I think this kind of crisis uh, uh, make the costs and the vulnerabilities in the embedded in the interdependency obvious and visible. And at the face of these vulnerabilities and sensibilities, actors try to find new way of uh, talking and negotiating and the new, new areas of cooperation. If they find, then they go away. Uh, if they uh, don't find, uh, then uh, the crisis actually covers all the rhetoric of uh, their relationship. Um, the crisis was the serious one uh, down at the jet, uh, but this was not un um, uh, the unexpected one. If we think the, uh, the 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 level of the crisis between Russia and NATO and uh, Russia and the West, both in uh, after, in context of Ukraine and crisis in Europe and in Syria, so. Uh, the uh, crisis was so serious, uh, but the answer, the reply of crisis uh, coming from Russia was so moderate. If we think the uh, re uh, real uh, context of the uh, sanctions on tomatoes or something, this actually these tomato sanctions uh, gave damage to tomato I mean, uh, uh, grow, uh, growing parties in Turkey, like the cheese uh, makers in France. But uh, Russia did not postpone, uh, did not actually cancel or withdraw from the uh, strategically important projects in Turkey, did not cut the gas the transfer uh, of gas, uh, the selling of gas from uh, north to south. So uh, if we look to the, to the moderate nature of uh, sanctions and responses coming from the uh, side of Moscow, we understand that Russia did not want to escalate this crisis mm. to the level to create non-cooperation situation between two parties. So. Uh, I think I I, uh, I actually uh, take the issues from more structural side maybe, and that is why I underline that this crisis, this type of crisis, can happen or will happen in future because the region, the regional balance of power is so fluctuating mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. and there are many points not only in Syria but there are many points in the uh, Mediterranean area or near uh, is uh, actually in turmoil. But these kind of crises just bring costs on the table. But the sites, if they uh, have intention to uh, uh, I mean, neglect these costs by creating new linkages, then they uh, succeed to do so. And they succeeded after the 2015 uh, crisis. And in seven months. Okay. Evet, within seven yeah. months, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And I want to open the floor for questions, if there are any. Gentlemen over here. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Uh, my name is Ali Demirdes. I have two questions. Uh, one of them is um, Russia is a gas monopoly over Europe. Mm. And Moscow is so adamant about keeping this status. On the other hand, the um, 
regional actors in Eastern Mediterranean are trying to rush to bring this trillions of cubic meters of gas to Europe. Mm. Um, what do you think Moscow is going to react to this endeavor? Do you think it's going to try to block this? If so, what are the options that Moscow would resort to to block this transfer of gas from Eastern Mediterranean to Europe? This my second question is, um, with the withdrawal of American troops in the eastern Euphrates, um, Russia footprint is spread into much of Syria. Do you see this is going to pose a limitation for Russia in the future? Uh, I'm thinking, is Syria going to be second Afghanistan in the long run uh, mm. when it comes mm. to this point? Thank you so much. Mm. Go ahead. For all of us, the question, okay. <laughs> uh, about the energy issue, I mean, I guess you were referring to ESMED project. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, that is so debatable. I will not go into the details, but uh, we know that it's not economically feasible project at the one hand. Uh, so that's technically can be happen, but it's so expensive and uh, the Europeans are aware of this, but uh, here we come to the geopolitics uh, on top of geoeconomics. And so uh, it's a political project and everybody knows that if there is enough gas in, uh, you know, around Cyprus, uh, this, uh, we know that Israel wants to, uh, you know, transit uh, some part of its uh, uh, new in 2000. Uh, nine, it was found, uh, some of its gas to Europe uh, via some way. At the beginning, it was through to Turkey and then to Europe. It was the shortest and uh, cheapest way of uh, delivering uh, the gas. And there was not enough to uh, fill this East Met only with Israeli gas. And uh, the Greek Cypriot ones that is found in 12th block, 12th, is not enough if they come to take together and refill the, if, of course, the pipeline will uh, be constructed. Mm -hmm. Then there is a chance that it could uh, be uh, uh, it will be transited to Europe. So this is the reality on the ground. Uh, but uh, I would like to remind you the uh, fate and history of Nobuka. It was a European project That's as well. Right. And uh, as everybody was writing and you know debating about oh, how uh, uh, you know attractive project it is and how the Europeans also were uh, behind it, all of a sudden we have uh, met with Tana project. So, I mean, uh, we know that uh, these pipelines may go here and there, uh, but uh, it is the, at the end of the way, it's the politics and geopolitics decision uh, comes to the table. Uh, but, but also, if I may, also a cost yeah. from our Azerbaijani colleagues. If there's not enough gas to go through and the cost isn't right, they won't construct. I have a whole issue on the Caspian Sea if yeah. you're interested. So, if the cost isn't right, then the, the, there's not enough gas to go through and they won't <laughs> construct it and they deal in meters of pipeline. Yeah. Okay, I had a special mm -hmm. conference in Paris on that subject. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. If there's not enough gas <laughs> to fill it. <laughs> so the, the idea behind this gas issue about the Mediterranean was initiated during the Obama period, as you remember. And it was Obama by then thought that uh, instead of dealing with other problems, uh, problematic and hard security problems of the Middle East, it thought, you know, if I cook this uh, gas issue in the Mediterranean, Perhaps uh, I can facilitate uh, some of the, you know, uh, not frozen, but, you know, other uh, deadlock problems. And it is an easy way of dealing. And it thought, you know, with one bird, it could kill many birds, it, but it didn't <laughs> it happen. Stunned, yeah. it, it stopped <laughs> all the, these uh, problems. And, for instance, uh, since Chris Montana, uh, the negotiations between the two sides in Cyprus is deadlock, and on top of many problems related to Cyprus issue. Now we have the gas uh, issue and it, it's a real uh, problem how it's going to be solved. And it's also blocking uh, the process. Uh, but about the Russians that you have mentioned, that's interesting. They are staying still, uh, but uh, they are in good position. We know that in Mediterranean, especially the bases that they had attained <laughs> in the western part of uh, Syria, uh, we know that uh, there are uh, lots of uh, gas reserves, uh, quite big reserves uh, in there. And so they made a 25 years old uh, uh, negotiation agreement Leasing. with the Assad yeah. regime. So they are uh, going to... Uh, 
uh, first, uh, you know, explore and use yeah. uh, whenever they decide to do that gas. But also, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm so sure that uh, they wouldn't like to have an alternative uh, way of transmitting uh, this, uh, whichever gas is there uh, to Europe, to bypass Russian dominance in Europe. But they, I am sure they also know what is uh, the reality on the ground. Uh, but they keep their silence at the moment. But of course, uh, don't for let's remember that they mentioned that uh, right after uh, Turkey has okay. sent its deep drilling uh, vessels, Yavuz and Fatih, uh, to the west and to the east of uh, Cyprus uh, to work, uh, they said, uh, some authorities, uh, oil companies, authorities said that if there is enough gas uh, found there, we are there to cooperate with Turkey's side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, gentlemen over there. If you could state your <clears throat> name and affiliation. I'm Scott Morgan. I'm a freelance security analyst. I cover mostly African issues. One question I would like the panel to address actually is the power projection. For example, the efforts to assist the Central African Republic emerge from, the, from its civil war, the, its, the Russian presence in Sudan during the transition after the ouster of Bashir. Uh, I would like to hear the panelists comment about that as a new way of power projection because there's some some of the arguments that we're seeing is that Russia is actually doing this to present itself as a viable option to both the United States and China in Africa. <coughs> Who wants to address this? I guess this? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not an uh, African expert, but I guess you're mentioning about uh, the recent uh, Russian re-engagement with Africa, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it was on the news, so that is uh, mm -hmm. that is a limited information that I have got. But uh, yes, uh, we know that China is there, U.S. is there in uh, uh, in African continent, and uh, uh, everybody has a bit surprised that uh, Russians were coming uh, to Africa. Uh, at, yeah, and that is the debate that was going on. But they were already there. I mean, this is not something new. Uh, what, how I can interpret is this uh, uh, from my perspective. Uh, Russia is trying to give uh, the image, even though it's limited, uh, that it is a great power. Uh, it's now back in the Middle East. Uh, Foreign Affairs says that this was an anomaly, which is normal is it's back. <laughs> So uh, in Africa too, uh, uh, I mean, it's a capacity, an economic capacity, what you can do there uh, within the, this competition among the uh, previous actors like China, for instance. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is a matter of, uh, you know, uh, image that you give. It's a great power and now it's back to Africa. But we can be sure that it, the role can be limited. But uh, we are living in a world of, uh, you know, uh, images that counts at the end of today. If I may. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh you Please, had an experience there, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. If I may, um, Russia is coming back, first of all, I mentioned the numbers. Russia is a $1 trillion dollar economy. Uh, it's the size of Belgium. Okay? Yeah. Just, just for some state. perspective. Yeah. Maybe Spain also. Spain. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just to keep the perspective on it, is absolutely right. It's about power projection, but it's yeah. also about expertise and extractive, yeah. you know, uh, capacities. Uh, many of these countries, as you know, and I have some experience in North Africa, uh, are looking to another expert or expert country mm -hmm. in this domain to uh, diversify or pump up some capacity. And, and Russia is, you must say, I mean, if you know what Russia does, Russia is an extractive power and has the yeah. expertise. Yes. However, they don't, may, may not have the latest expertise, but they are very adaptable and supple and maybe less expensive than other mm -hmm. uh, companies, for example. So a, they can be a good competitor. Uh, can they be a reliable, for example, supplier? These, these relationships are building up, as Nershan recommended and said, that on a geopolitical basis, Africa and some African countries are looking for another alternative to other powers, be it France, uh, be, it, be it the US. Uh, so there's a diversification of actors. Uh, there's also, as Russia tries to uh, enlarge in its footprint in the Middle East, it's getting some more echoes uh, down through and in Africa. I want to add something related to it, this issue. Also. I am not expert of African studies mm -hmm. or Russian uh, foreign policy in Africa, but 
Russia can follow the same path uh, that she followed in Mediterranean, in Africa also, by adapting a hybrid strategy. And uh, maybe we can, we should think what kind of couplings actually yeah. emerge from this, I mean, Russian rapprochement with some regional or close regional powers. Uh, so uh, I uh, I expect an interesting coupling also can emerge from this kind of hybrid strategy. I also mention it, but will not mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have uh, eight minutes left, so I will ask the last round of questions. Okay. If you can answer uh, in a in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, this time we will start with okay. Vishnanam. And you mentioned the ring of friends that Russia yeah. is trying to create, and Turkey is a significant part yes. of that plan. But how about the areas that Russia and Turkey disagree or not un not very friendly with? Yes. Right, including Ukraine, Georgia, Nagorno-Karabakh, and even you know like Black Sea yeah. region, even yeah. now Eastern Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. How they can reconcile those differences when okay. Russia is trying to create that ring of friends strategy? Okay. Okay, uh, maybe, uh, I mean, they choose, till now, they choose to use compartmentalization together with this, I mean, uh, uh, together with this um, uh, mutual advantages linkage strategy. Actually, on theoretical level or on paper, we expect that these two strategies are not so uh, good couples because they imply different kind of behavior uh, for the actors. But till today, Russia and Turkey uh, successfully, I mean, follow off these two strategies together just because they intended to cooperate. They want to cooperate on the issues they can cooperate. This creates bargaining power for both sides at the face of rivals. They know that, and by this rationality, they act. Uh, since the competition between Russia and US continue in Eastern Mediterranean and in Mediterranean and on Europe, we will expect the same path in the future. But of course, there, there can be certain crises, some serious, some non-serious crises. But this path, I expect, uh, create a, a clear path for these two ca uh, capitals till uh, the US decide to uh, go uh, with how uh, she go with Turkey and Moscow on European and Middle Eastern security. Okay. Uh, compartmentalization was one of the sexiest words in this yeah. town to explain <laughs> the divergence of interest between Turkey and US for the next five, six years. It, it's not working that well, so I yeah. hope your optimism works with Russia. Inshallah. And uh, Inshallah. In, regards to, in regards to uh, Ukrainian crisis, what did Ukrainian crisis taught uh, Russian foreign policy? What did Russia learn from this crisis? Hmm. Good question. Um, I asked good question. I told you. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Uh, what did it teach Russia? Well, in terms of its former republics, um, that the rise or the liberation or the evolution towards market economies um, and so there's two parts, actually. Uh, the acceptance or the rejection of, uh, from, for example, Ukraine to Europe, wanting to go home to Europe, for example. Uh, and then the rejection of that. In other words, some of these Soviet republics were not well prepared, uh, did not have the capacity to, you know, uh, first of all, as you know, they all need to join NATO first before they join the EU. So there's a military side to this. Um, some of them were not prepared, were not well trained, could not integrate. And finally, I would say that some of them were able to, but I think there is a strong linkage, and we talk about linkage and compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. There's also the balance of power, and mm -hmm. Ukraine is That's particularly important to Russia less so probably than some of the other smaller republics. The reason I mentioned the GDP of the countries, it's important to know that Ukraine is the biggest economy. It is the breadbasket of, of Russia. It was the, um, uh, what do you call it, the rocket capital. It has the minerals. It has a lot of things that Russia needs 
to continue to um, project its own power. Uh, I find it difficult that Russia would let Ukraine go in, in, in any way, mm -hmm. uh, due, given the destabilization of this mineral east uh, in the Donbass. And just because letting Ukraine go, um, to my mind, uh, no longer gives Russia that um, outlet, of course, that it now has with Crimea to the Black Sea. Uh, and all the aspects of its beginnings, there's a historical, it's very difficult to say it in such a short period of time, but this historical um, uh, seat, if you will, that's so symbolic uh, for many Russians that still keeps it, uh, and I think Russia will stay linked to Ukraine for a long time. Thank you. And Nurshin Hanım, you mentioned the hybrid mechanism, and that's the set strategy for Russia. And Mike Tyson has this very famous quote saying that everybody has a plan until they got punched in their nose. <laughs> so what would be the moment that Russia would think that this strategy is not working? Well, what I would mean, be the game changer? A game changer uh, would be power shift in the region. Uh, but in what sense? Uh, in what sense? Uh, they are in the Mediterranean at the moment. But I don't think they would uh, would uh, like to go beyond uh, Mediterranean, meaning yeah. to the overseas. They would definitely not do that. But uh, being back in the Middle East via back door of Syria, uh, with the uh, you know call of uh, Assad regime, uh, they will try to uh, hold on to what they have gained so far and try to balance uh, the rivalries and especially the West and the US and others, the allies. Uh, but uh, I mean, I know what you mean. Uh, they, they are already overstretched. So uh, that is why I'm saying that they will go along with this hybrid mechanism. Uh, not to go with C, they would, uh, they had already gained uh, the bases and everything. Uh, they retreat some of their troops, as you know, from Syria. And so um, with these alignments, issue-based alignments, Astana, Sochi, whatever, they will try to hold on. I don't uh, think that uh, they, they shouldn't be making the mistakes the Americans has made. Okay. Okay. I should underline this, uh, <laughs> meaning they should not rely on non-state actors like PYD, mm -hmm. uh, because these instruments seem to be uh, practical uh, use uh, instruments on the ground. Uh, but uh, uh, we have the experience of Americans in Afghanistan, for instance. Yeah. Uh, so Russia, Russia has its experience in yeah, Afghanistan. Russia, yeah, so. that's what I mean. So <laughs> yeah. they should rem remember their experiences mm -hmm. and uh, so as not to uh, this mechanism and mechanism uh, dreams of theirs already failed. So they had already experienced double failure. And this time, uh, this is the new opportunity ahead of them. Okay. And Turkey Can stands something? there as the great balancer. And mm -hmm. uh, it could be uh, the absolute uh, gain uh, for the Russians if they think wise enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for the panel. And thank you very much for thank coming. You. And please join me thanking for our panelists.